So the big story of the day is that the opposition parties have managed their second meeting. This one's taking place in Bangalore and 24 opposition parties are coming together to have that meeting where they will uh, sort of create a united front against the BJP. Now, a couple of things that have played out in the last two days. The Aam Admi Party has agreed to be part of this meeting. Arvind Kejriwal's posters were put up in Bangalore along with everybody else's quite quickly when he decided to be part of this uh, conversation. Remember, it was because the Congress took until the last minute to decide whether or not it will support the Aam Admi Party against the ordinance brought by the central government that effectively gives the power over the IAS officers in Delhi to the central government and not to the state government as the Supreme Court had decided. Now, this is where we are. There is a two-day meeting taking place in Bangalore. Almost uh, all the large opposition parties are going to be there. There are 24 this time, much more than the 16 that met in Patna in June, which means they're, more, they're, they're a considerable number. Now, back of the envelope calculation puts their um, you know, Lok Sabha seats at about 144 right now. A couple of interesting players have decided not to join the opposition. They're sort of keeping their cards close to their chest. Naveen Patnaik, uh, for example, has not said which which side he's going to join. Uh, the YSR Congress uh, has not picked a side. Neither has the TDP, which is Chandra Babu Naidu. Uh, the JDS, uh, which is Deva Gowda in Karnataka, is not with the opposition, but has not declared for the NDA either. Uh, Akali Dal um, from Punjab and, of course, Mayavati's uh, BSP have not decided which side they're going to be part of. They have not declared which side they're going to be part of just yet. Um, the BJP, interestingly, is holding its own show of strength tomorrow in Delhi, where it will bring together all NDA allies. There are uh, a considerable number of NDA allies, 30 allies altogether. A couple of new faces there will be Eknath Shinde and his faction of uh, the Shiv Sena, Ajit Pawar and his faction of the NCP. Now, uh, Here's the interesting thing about Ajit Pawar. The senior Pawar, Sharad Pawar, is keeping everybody guessing because he hasn't gone to Bangalore yet. He's missed, skipped the first day. And his team came out and said, no, 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 he's going to attend the second day. But then there were a couple of surprises thrown in, which is typical Pawar style. He had two back-to-back -back meetings on Sunday and on Monday with Ajit Pawar, Praful Patel, Chagan Bujbal and a bunch of the other, um, you know, uh, leaders who had left or sort of split from the NCP. Praful Patel actually came out after the second meeting and said that they met with Sharad Pawar and asked him to keep the party together, which means they're trying to get him onto the NDA and the BJP side. Now, Sharad Pawar, like I said, has kept people guessing, although he made a statement on Sunday evening to the youth wing of his own party saying he can't support the BJP because he'll always stand with progressive politics. Now, here are the interesting things to analyze. The opposition um, you know, grouping of 24 parties, what are they likely to decide and arrive at in this, uh, you know, in this meeting? First of all, they have to come up with a name. There is no name. We're calling them the opposition, uh, you know, front or the united front. But actually what they really are is an anti-BJP front. Uh, they're non-BJP leaders who are coming together to sort of battle um, the considerable popularity of the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So what they are is an anti-BJP front, but they really need a better name. So they're not the UPA. They're going to have to come up with a better name. So that's something we can expect. They'll also have to come up with a common, minim common minimum program. Or like I call it, a basic something that they can all agree on before they go into this election because anti-BJP can't be the only thing that brings them together. They have to have some sort of philosophy, some sort of ideology going into the election. And currently, there doesn't seem to be uh, anything available on the ground that they're arguing for. There were some questions on whether they will discuss seat sharing. Some of the leaders from the Congress said it's early days. Not only is it early days, but there's no evidence really that they've managed to do this in the past either. Now, remember, in order to discuss seat sharing, they will have to decide or the Congress will have to decide not to contest in some constituencies and allow the other parties to contest so that they're not cutting each other's votes against the BJP. Um, because the person, say, for example, who's going to vote for the BJP will vote for the BJP. The person who is not going to vote for the BJP, if that person has two choices, which is Congress and non-Congress, then those votes are likely to get split down the middle, which makes the BJP stronger. That is really the big question that they will have to answer, which is unlikely to get answered in this mini in this particular meeting. The other thing to look at is the BJP themselves that is now you know, doing a meeting of the NDA, like I told you, and it's 30 allies. What is happening with the BJP? Now, remember, going into this election, 
It's a little different from the previous elections. Um, the first one in 2014 and 2019, the idea, for example, of anti-corruption. Remember, the prime minister has always stood for anti-corruption. That we're not with anyone who is corrupt, and we will, you know, bring the law hard down on anybody who is corrupt, and we will not compromise in any way. Now, that particular argument has been compromised. Tremendously by the entry of Ajit Pawar, Praful Patel, Shakar Bujbal into that party because these are people who the BJP was taking up against until four weeks ago, saying that they're extremely corrupt people and all they have to offer is corruption. Now these people stand with the BJP uh, and one wonders how that is possible. Now the arguments made by BJP spokespeople in various debates about this is that let the law take its course, we're not passing judgment on anyone. But if you fundamentally believe that these people were corrupt, uh, and you've said so over and over again publicly, accused them of being corrupt, told citizens not to vote for them because they're corrupt. How can you possibly be standing with them now? And that really draws a big question uh, on the whole anti-corruption argument. The other argument is a chedin or, you know, a better world that you will get uh, specifically economically when the BJP is in power. Now the BJP has been in power for nearly 10 years, as it will be when, you know, the country goes to vote. Uh, petrol is extremely expensive. Petrol, diesel at 100 rupees. LPG cylinders at 1,000 rupees. Tomatoes and vegetables are extremely expensive at this point. So it is... Inflation, per se, and the numbers are not displaying this, but a lot of people are finding it difficult to run their houses. These are the actual prices of things that are running right now. This makes uh, life difficult for common people. Um, there is, of course, a little. some of the bubbles are bursting. Gig workers are finding it very difficult to make ends meet. So delivery people, Uber drivers, Ola drivers, you know, that sort of gig employment, um, you know, is coming under tremendous stress. Uh, we've seen protests from various people who are part of the startup sort of uh, gig environment, which was used earlier by this government to justify that employment is being created. That employment is actually struggling right now to be justified. There's a lot of layoffs across the board uh, within um, you know, the startup industry, within other industries as well. So there are some question marks that are being drawn on whether things are actually better um, or in, in what capacity are things better. Um, you know, the Hindutva idea has not worked, we've seen in Karnataka. Uh, the Northeast right now is asking questions about the handling of Manipur. Uh, many people in the Northeast are feeling... Um, you know, sort of abandoned um, and not cared for. And, you know, one wonders how that will play out uh, when the Lok Sabha elections draws around um, next year. The, the you know, the, the Narendra Modi government has done really well in foreign policy and overseas. But the question to ask is how much of an impact does that have on um, people's lives as they live their daily lives and they buy their groceries for their kitchens and, you know, they put fuel in their scooters and they go to work and they make those deliveries which a large number of people across our country are doing, does, you know, how much of that policy is actually making sense? Now, some of the big wins for this government are the infrastructure that has been built, the roads, the highways, the airports, um, you know, stuff like that, and, and the impact that that has on people's lives. So really, these are the things that will come into question uh, as we go into the next election. The question really is, can the opposition in its meeting arrive at a philosophy that is outside of we are not BJP or we don't stand with the BJP? And can they offer the citizens of India a more cohesive, coherent offering, uh, saying that your lives will be different and better for these three reasons, or we will be able to handle these problems that you're facing in such a way, this is what we all collectively believe. And if they can arrive at that, then they might be something more to talk about. Otherwise, we're largely going to have a very you know, a large photo op that will show up on the front pages of our papers, but it won't actually you know, materialize into anything. Um, let me know what you think of the opposition coming together. Do you think that they're going to actually manage to put something together? Will they arrive at some sort of an understanding? Are, are each of these individual egos going to pull apart? Because remember, each of these opposition parties are run by uh, very popular leaders. Mamta Banerjee is popular. Arvind Kejriwal is popular. In the South, M.K. Stalin is popular. So each of them are running sort of their own little parties um, and they're all fairly popular within their states. And that is really the power they're bringing to this meeting. So can they sort of put aside those egos and that, you know, the, the ego that comes with that popularity and arrive at something that they can all agree on? 
that's the question really to answer. Let me know what you think in the comment section. And we'll keep an eye on this because it's going to get more interesting as we go further and further into that general elections. Also remember, uh, like, share, subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. Also remember, like, share, subscribe as always and download the Beetroot app for more news and updates from across the world. It is our offering to you where we fact check everything, we prioritize everything and we offer you the news in the cleanest, most wholesome way possible. Thank you. For more news and updates, download the Beetroot news app from the App Store and the Play Store.